Uh, you know, there, there were good environmental groups one time that, you know, we were, we were concerned about dirty water and, and litter and you know, making sure our air was clean, our water was clean, and all of a sudden all that changed. And I, I have some very close friends who are, were involved in the Sierra Club and the Audubon Society who left because they no longer recognized those groups and they were concerned about the environment and still are. So, yeah. back there. Um, Joe Wilson. I understand today the Occupy Bellingham group is trying to occupy our county council. So how does the Occupy movement tie into all of this? That's, that's a good question, and, and they're all over the place. And what I've heard, I, I was in uh, Albany, New York uh, a week or so ago, and they had another group there, and, and, and they were just joking, but they'd ask them questions, and these people had you know, no answer. Uh, they didn't know what they wanted. Uh, in some cases, there were some good people there who actually maybe understood we needed the Constitution and so forth, and there are other people all over the place. I, I think the Occupy movement uh, is a direct result of our American education system of, of kids who studied the 60s and how cool it was, uh, so let's do that too. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, there's much more to it than that, obviously. Uh, I've heard that George Soros is uh, funding a huge amount of it, and uh, so, you know, there obviously is a purpose to all that, but to the kids themselves who were there, they really don't know why. I, I, I was at a uh, conference on global warming uh, not long ago, and one of the presenters there was saying that somebody came up to him, uh, this college student, and said, uh, we have got to stop the use of coal, and we've got to stop it right now. And he said, okay, what do we replace it with? And the student says, well, electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the education system we have. They don't know what they're doing. So, yeah. <laughs> Elliot Fine, and um, I'm a proud member of PETA, People eating tasty animals. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, you spoke briefly on the groups that are attacking you, trying to paint you with the uh, Timothy McVeigh brush, and I wonder if you could expound upon that. I know the SPLC has done that, and they've got the ear of a lot of people yeah. up there in the government. So, yeah. what are you doing to actively combat them? Laughing at them. <laughs> uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. This is very interesting. Uh, this organization, which is a private NGO organization, and uh, they, they just follow us around. We have conferences and so forth, they, they send people there. The last time we had a national conference last year we had in Valley Forge, I, I said at the very beginning, uh, if you're here from the Southern Poverty Law Center, will you please buy the video after this is over so you can quote us correctly? It's right on the video, so I don't know. Uh, but they did it anyway. And, uh, and, and the thing is, you say, okay, so, so what? Because groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center are training policemen uh, to uh, what to watch for, and uh, you know the you ha and they're directly working with the Department of Homeland Security. I've got two reports put out by the Department of Homeland Security that uh, talks about uh, domestic terrorists. I'm a domestic terrorist, and. Um, uh, you know, it's anybody, and they have a whole list of, you know, they have a, the, the lexicon, the, the definitions. And a domestic terrorist is anyone who believes in the Constitution, talks about that, somebody who's, who's against abortion, somebody who uh, is upset about the economy, I love that one, uh, somebody who's upset because American jobs are going overseas. And they, they just painted this broad brush and said, everybody doesn't agree with this, is a terrorist. And, but the, they are training policemen for what to watch for. And uh, we had a report from a, 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 a gentleman who uh, came out of Louisiana. He was driving his pickup truck one night on the road and a cop pulled him over. And he said, why did you pull me over? And he pointed at his NRA bumper sticker. This stuff has an effect. When the, uh, the, the shooting took place at the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., the very next day, the news reports had sidebar articles about the Department of Homeland Security's reports about how they predicted this kind of thing would happen. That's why they're watching these right-wing fanatics, because we're all going to open up and start shooting on everybody. We're all part of malicious. So, I mean, this, this is what we face. Now, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was in a, a meeting in Richmond, Virginia, with uh, uh, a couple of other activists, uh, con uh, County Commissioner Richard Rothschild from Ca Carroll County, Maryland. This man is a national treasure. He was the first. He was just elected last January, and, he, and they had five, including him, five new commissioners, a whole new board. 
And he had shown them all, taught them all, I'm very proud to say he used my materials to teach them about Agenda 21. And the first thing they did when they came in to the um, uh, in, into office was to dismiss the sustainable manager that the county had hired and then they revoked the membership in Ickley. They were the first in the country. And then they had a meeting with the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission comes in with, with their, their uh, comprehensive development plan they're working on. And Richard sits there and watching. And finally, and they're talking about this section of town where they're going to tear everything down and they're, they're going to redevelop it into some kind of a business uh, uh, plan. And, and Richard just said, uh, what about the property rights? And they just stopped and they said, what property rights? <laughs> he said, people live there. There are homes there. Uh, we, they had a contract with us that we would protect them there. What are we going to do about that? Uh, yeah. To go on farther, and pretty soon Richard said something else about, what about the Constitution? How does that fit with that? It's like, what Constitution? You know? right. They eventually, at the end of the meeting, rejected the plan. They sent it back to the Planning Commission and said, bring it back to us when it, when it protects private property rights and is upheld by the Constitution. That was the first step. So Richard's with me in Richmond with some other people. We're going to have a meeting with state legislators. I didn't have anything to do with organizing the meeting, so I didn't know who was invited. We're sitting there, and all these people, about 30 people come in. And uh, the uh, moderator had said, would everybody kind of stand up and introduce themselves? And I just went, Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, planning uh, lawyers, the, uh, the room is full. It was a perfect consensus meeting. They set out in the perfect triangle. Every time we opened our mouth, they said, I can't believe what I'm hearing here. And if you were standing at the back of the room, you'd say, those people out in front are nuts, and all these people seem to be reasonable. That was, their, that was what they did. They did it on purpose to make sure we never got a word in edgewise to these state legislators. So that's, uh, that's what, what's what happens. Yeah. Chris Halterman. Giving a contract to an NGO group to see if they can implement the Ruffles House bill in Whatcom County, which is all about creating commissions and councils on watershed and water rights in the county, taking it out of our county council's um, business and putting it into the hands of a commission and council, which is governed by the state and federal government. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, that's my whole speech. You know, that's, that's what I just described to you. And, and that's the point. These non-elected boards, councils, regional governments, where, you know, they, they, they talk about, like a regional government, for example, they, you know, well, five different communities come together. In Washington, D.C., we've got Maryland and Virginia and Washington, D.C. They all come here together. Well, we just all get together and we'll talk about all these things and what affects all of us. All well and good, but who elected these people? Who put them in there? Who answers to, you know, who do they answer to? How many of you uh, cast your vote for the, in the latest election of the uh, head of the United Nations? <laughs> right. Same thing with the regional councils and so forth. When these boards are set up, then, you know, it, you know, our government was designed so that the local government was the most responsive. It has the most influence on you, should be, and, has, you know, and you should have the most impact on it. You, could be, you should be able to call your county city councilman, your county commissioner, and have coffee with them, sit down, and discuss things with them as friends, as neighbors. And when these boards come in and get set up, there's a new line there, and, and, and they'll, they will rightly say to you, well, I don't have any, you know, uh, you're going to need to talk to the Planning Commission about that. You're going to need to talk to uh, the, the Historic Preservation Commission or the Water Council or whatever. You need to talk about it. You've just had a layer of your government removed from you because what are they going to say when you go in there? You know, what's their reaction? So this is what, if we're going to restore the republic, if we're going to keep the government that we had from the beginning, this must be stopped. And, uh, you know, your representatives have got to be answerable to you. So. Uh, I am Dan Johnson. I own some property out in the county, and this matters to me, and it makes sense. How do I, or how do we convince people who don't have anything at stake mm -hmm. that this whole yes. plan is not good? Uh, how, that, how do you convince somebody that lives in town 
on a block with a lot with their posted stamp of grass that now they're going to have to in the winter be required to shovel snow off the city sidewalk or they're going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. That is an excellent question, and I, you know, I probably don't have a proper answer for you. We are we're just learning how to how to react to some of this stuff. Uh, I think the implementation of a property rights council that's job is to watch for any legislation that's violating property rights is an excellent first start. One of the things that they're working on is this county commissioner uh, in, in Idaho who came up with this, uh, I met with him, and uh, a very articulate guy, and he understands, and he understood that you sitting on the city council or the county commission, you as a citizen come in and say something there about your property is being violated by, by a certain thing. and. You know, the, the, the sustainables are going to be there with an, a, a wall of experts. They've got PhDs, they've got people with high titles, they, you know, experts, scientists, and they're, gonna, and, and they're going to surround your elected officials and give them all kinds of highfalutin language and, and official reports and everything as to why, why they're doing what they're doing and too bad for you, but, but this needs to be done. What uh, the commissioner in, in Idaho is doing is he's hooking up, there is a network of property rights uh, think tanks across the country and, and limited government think tanks. And he's teaming up with them so that when this team of experts come in from this side, our side has its own team of experts too. And uh, so that we have an, a, an evil, uh, evil a, a level playing field. <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> Whichever, yeah. And uh, I mean, that's a good first stop, start. Uh, I, I jokingly wrote, there's an, uh, an article out, a newsletter out on the table out here about how to fight back against sustainable development, which is now outdated because it's like three months old. But um, I, I said in that that we never got that far before. Uh, we, we've spent 18 years saying, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And, and, and we couldn't get people to listen precisely for what you're saying. People weren't affected by it. Out in the rural areas, the, the timber people understood, the ranchers understood, the mining people understood, but in the cities, they didn't. Uh, and so, uh, everything that we had was saying that. And now I'm starting to get people saying, okay, I get it, what do I do? And I had to say, gee, I don't know, I never got that far before. So we're learning, and uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm putting together a Stop Agenda 21 action kit. This will have everything I can think of. I, I put out surveys to activists. What do you need? What kind of things will, will be important to you? And it, it's, it's going to have a manual with all the details in it. It's going to have a workbook that has a spiral binding that you can make copies. It'll have copies of legislation. It has copies of reports on, uh, on uh, comprehensive development plans. And you know, we go through it line by line and how it uh, pertains to Agenda 21. Uh, it, it's, it's going to have sample letters to the editor, it's going to have sample uh, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, everything I can think of is, is going to be in this thing. We'll have it ready, I hope we're going to launch it by January 1, but uh, we're, we're working on getting answers to that. Where's the web? Yes. Where's the website? Uh, AmericanPolicy.org is our website. Next question. We still have some time. Well, if you read all of their documents, they, they talk about, uh, you know, they, they def define the governments and, uh, and, and tribal governments is, is very prominently in every single document. So they're working hard to bring them on board too. And uh, uh, this is something that we really need to work on because uh, the, you know, if, if you look at it from their point of view, they ought to be totally opposed to all this. But because it's all sold in environmental terms, then, then they get sucked into it. But uh, there's no difference in what they're doing with Agenda 21 than what the U.S. government did <laughs> to them breaking promises and taking property, saying, move over, we need this, we need this, you know. And they ought to recognize this very quickly. But uh, you know, they're very prominently uh, focused on this and they're, they're, they're targeted. Nada yeah. Deitch. I have a question. Do you think our congressmen know about this? 
Because, well, uh, why I'm asking is because here's a group of people that we're trying to encourage to write, to write letters to the editor, go to council meetings, get involved because it's a business oriented uh, club, and we need to contact our legislators. I have written letters, <coughs> call them, but if you call them, or even on their email, they don't even ignore it. You need to write the letter so they can look at it. That's what yeah. Slade Gordon told me. So do you think yeah. that would be a thing the, uh, You know, up until 10 months ago, I had never met an elected official anywhere who had ever heard of this. Well, anywhere. That changed with Richard Rothschild, and it's changing rapidly as, as we go along. I'm, I'm having meetings now with legislators and meetings with county commissioners. They're asking for meetings with me, even the news media. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, a few months ago, I got a phone call from the Tea Party liaison to Newt Gingrich. Oh. And he said, everywhere Newt goes, he's being asked about Agenda 21. Oh. And when he gives his lame answers, oh. they say, you need to call Tom DeWeese. <laughs> so they did. Not long after that, uh, I was out in Montana a couple, a few weeks, uh, about a month ago, and uh, the internet absolutely lit up. Newt Gingrich went on Sean Hannity's radio show and talked about Agenda 21. He then, there's, now there's a video on where he's talking about it, I guess, in a meeting in Florida as well. So, um, you know, that, that changed it. And I know that if Newt Gingrich is getting these answers, so is every other presidential candidate. And we need to step that up and make sure, if you go to caucuses, if you go to meetings where presidential candidates are there, or any candidate, really, start asking that question. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's what's, you know, if they have to answer, if they're in front of an audience and the audience isn't buying their answer, they're going to want to get a good answer. And uh, uh, so that's the beginning of now. Your question about congressmen. Uh, there are some. Yes, Michelle Bachman does, Ron Paul does, Rand Paul does. Uh, although I was very disturbed by a letter I saw by Rand Paul acknowledging, somebody wrote to him about it, and, and acknowledging, uh, yes, yes, I, understand, I know about Agenda 21 and so forth, and if Congress ever has a, a, a bill before it to make that law of this land, I'll vote against it. Oh, no. Rand, we got to talk. <laughs> but uh, so that's, that's the terms they think in. You know, legislation. Well, how many times have you talked to a congressman about an issue and he'll say, well, let me see the bill and we'll take a look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have a lot of work to do there, no question. Right. Yes. Yeah. First questions first, Chris. Hold on. Here's uh, Bill Geyer. You got a Hi, Bill Geyer. I'm going to ask a question in a roundabout way here. <laughs> the 11th Circuit District uh, Appeals Court, Washington, D.C., yesterday found in favor for the U.S. government as it relates to the health care bill. It is Obamacare. And one of the judges wrote a, a very compelling piece. It was in the Wall Street Journal. that talked about, I'm going to paraphrase, that essentially individual rights are not something to be honored. We have to honor the collective. And therefore, that Congress is allowed to mandate various uh, commerce. And it went to the core issue of whether or not Congress can compel us to purchase a commodity, in this case, health care. So we have now uh, three district courts, appeal courts, that have found in that fashion, one that's found in opposite viewpoints. So this will come to the Supreme Court, which comes to a property rights question, which, if this is heard, comes forth in January, July, somewhere, excuse me, June or July next year, ostensibly. How do you see that decision impacting <coughs> position that you're presenting, because at, at its core you're speaking to individual rights that are naturally uh, in, uh, inherent to all of us, and if the government on one hand is com allows, the, it can compel us to purchase something, I would argue it can compel us to not purchase something. No, that's, so yeah, what, what yeah. do you see going forward next year when that decision is made in either case, either for the government position or against the government position? If, if the Supreme Court upholds the health care, uh, they have said, exactly what we said, government has the power to tell us to do anything. And uh, you know, the, the, the most incredible Supreme Court decision made in this regard was a Kelo decision back in 2005, first time ever that the, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court said that well, essentially, it's just said there's no private property rights. It, it said if, if government, if a local community can make more money off a piece of property than what's being used for now, they have a, a right because of community. This is all, all of it is sustainable development. And the, uh, I, I think I'm still the only person 
who, who wrote about the Kelo decision saying, uh, because everybody was shocked by this, because uh, there's no precedence whatsoever that uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, that, that they should take that position. But uh, the fact is that if you listen, Stephen Breyer and other members of the court have said over and over again that we now need to look at international law to decide how we come down on these things. And uh, I stated at the time, I wrote an article and I said, the Supreme Court had to make that decision because we are committed to sustainable development. They had to make that